speaker is Nick Burnt, which I would pronounce Baron, but it's Burnt for everybody, he says, uh, which is a kind of an unfortunate name for a person who works for the U.S. Forest Service, Burnt. But uh, uh, I understand that Nick is a fishery biologist who works for the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest uh, and deals largely with riparian management. At least that's what we're asking to talk about. I understand he's had some recent chaos in, in his, his life. And so I don't, I don't have his biographical material. I'll let him uh, sort of introduce himself. In fact, I understand that he almost completely lost his talk and was gonna have to give it off cuff, but it has somehow or another magically turned up. So let's hear your presentation. This, this is to the right, this forward. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Burnt. I'm the West Zone fish biologist for the Schwamgen Nicolay National Forest and uh, one of the very few fish staff on the forest um, right now. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about just kind of management techniques we do on the forest, just some general observations that I know a lot of you guys who are kind of um, really like in the streams doing the field work probably notice these things as well. Um, I know my last couple of weeks I've been busting brush cutting and stuff so um, this is kind of geared towards that. So um, the National Forest, oh and excuse me I got I got COVID really bad three weeks ago and it's killed my voice so excuse me if I got a cough or something. Um, trout habitat, it varies very widely on the forest. Um, it's a huge forest. You can see that from the map here. Um, I work out of Park Falls, which is right about here. Um, I am on the West Zone National Forest. And um, you can see, let's say you go to Park Falls, Medford, and you run across a trout stream that looks like this. And to a lot of people, that does not look like trout water. It is tannic, it's pretty warm, um, covered in tag alder, very low gradient. You don't see the big boulders and cascades like you see out west. And it doesn't look very impressive, but it grows some nice fish. Um, you go up towards the Great Divide Range. Uh, this is, I believe, 18 mile uh, creek. Uh, you get a nice, beautiful, you know, mature trees on the shores, no tag alder. Um, this is kind of what I look forward to, to go into. Um, it's not a tag alder forest. Um, you go on the east side, this is uh, Barney Creek, a beautiful little class one that is one of my favorite streams. Um, it's near uh, kind of Townsend area, um, grows big fish and lots of fish. I was getting numbers close to 3,000 a mile, which is the highest I've ever seen on the waters I'm managing. So um, it's a fish factory. <clears throat> nope. Okay, so habitat problems that we do not see on the national forest. Um, we, I rarely have a stream that goes dry. I don't have livestock on the national forest getting into my streams. Um, we don't have any big dams. Um, Fire, pretty much non-existent. We don't get these big ash flows in our in the national forest, things like that. So um, there's a lot of things that that don't happen in the national forest in northern Wisconsin that happen in other parts of the country. That um, they're not really a problem here, but we have our own problems, though. Don't don't you worry. <clears throat> um, the biggest problem that I mean, that we're still recovering from is logging error damage on many of our systems. I mean, when you look, I mean, it's hard to fathom the amount of weight and forces that were exerted on our streams on the National Forest in the logging era and just banks were plowed, the, you know, trees were cut right to the shore and um, we're still feeling the effects of that. Um, a lot of our smaller streams have become tag alder do dominant um, even if the soils are pretty decent and, and um, you know, larger trees could grow there, they simply don't because it's just been the monoculture for so long. Um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, some of the sedge meadows uh, where we have really good trout habitat are being replaced by, by tag alder. Um, by far, the trout streams that I deal with are extremely low gradient. Um, you know, like I said before, they're not your classic trout streams where you get the nice cascades and, you know, um, riffle pool, that sort of thing. It's just kind of a big, slow ditch in a wetland, but it surprisingly grows nice fish. Um, I think the brook trout in some of the, on the West Zone anyways, they don't get enough credit for being um, as resilient as they are. Um, I think they, you know, a lot of the streams, they, they just don't look like trout water, but they harbor some really nice fish and naturally reproducing fish. Um, I have a lot of large spreading wetlands that I deal with um, that are adjacent to trout streams, and they're just really hard to manage with the crew that I have. I'm a crew of one, and I pretty much beg other crews for help a lot of the times. Um, so I'm usually dealing with like um, me and like two or other, three other people that do management. Um, so it's just tough when you got a big area that needs some help. Um, all these problems were amplified by years of timber management that really didn't prioritize watershed health and they get lopped off every 40, 50 years. And, and um, there's, you know, we're, we're a wood production forest so we get the wood out. Um, but that wasn't always, managing watersheds wasn't always the, the top priority there. So um, one of the best habitat features <coughs> that we have are the sedge meadow. And um, they're very desirable. Um, they have steep, secure banks, deep, dense roots, uh, promote a very narrow channel. And one of the best parts is lower food for beaver. Um, as you can see, the, the gradient's extremely slow here. Any current is very attractive to beaver in these uh, parts of the streams. So you take away the food, the beaver um, don't really come around. So um, I get a lot of questions about, oh, hey, these streams are, you know, they get a lot of sunlight. Um, isn't, you know, I thought trout streams needed shade and things like that, but um, it's the depth and the flow in these sedge meadows that really help the trout out. And um, when you get the depth and um, the flow, you get undercuts, which are very important for trout habitat. Um, so they, they can find places to hide and, and get their colder water. So here's an example of a sedge, sedge meadow evolution um, in Ashland County. This is Camp 15 Creek. Um, you can see in the course of 10 years, it went from a beaver dominated stream to a stream um, where the beaver dams have disappeared. And this is not a stream that we manage for beaver. Um, we do not um, remove beaver, or take out the dams on the stream. This is all natural. So it's kind of a, a unique case. Um, 2010, the survey found a lot of warm water fish, a lot of pike. This connects to the um, East Fork Chippewa River. There's walleye in the stream. Um, it's just a basically a completely different stream than what we found in 2020 um, when I was in there. And we got these nice, big, beautiful brook trout. Um, the cold water fish came back with, without the beaver there. Here's another uh, section from Camp 15 Creek. I'm sorry, this is actually Springbrook. I mislabeled here. You can see over the course of, you know, almost 30 years that uh, the stream has been beaver impacted uh, over and over. Um, the beaver dams come, they go, and the fish have moved accordingly. So right now, if you were to fish this stretch right here, you would catch some really large brook trout. There's some really nice fish there. Um, but 1992, that most likely was not the case when this was a big uh, beaver plugged the culvert up and you had this big backflow here. So that's something that, you know, I, I really, we really can't manage a lot of this because the it's just so much land area, but we're finding that the trout in the older surveys from the seventies and eighties that I go through, um, if there wasn't trout there then, and there is now, it just kind of says to me that they're, they're fairly resilient, um, surprisingly for how slow and how warm the water is. This spring brook right now is about 71 degrees. So it's not classic cold trout water. It's, it's pretty warm. 
And it's surprising how many fish are actually there. To me, anyway. <clears throat> so like I've said before, um, we kind of get this ebb and flow of meadow, alder, and beaver interactions that really can't be fully controlled. Um, you know, it's not convenient to me as a fisherman that if it's a beaver dam or a beaver pond right now and there's no trout in it, that I, you know, it seems like long, later out along the line, if conditions improve, those trout will move right back in there, um, which is like, like we saw on uh, Camp 15 there at the warm water to cold water conversion. And there's a um, beautiful trout from that spring brook. So um, kind of what we do on the forest, we cut any alder to maintain bank integrity. Um, you see, we, we, this is something we'd want to continue. We want the sedge meadow back, um, but the stream has widened over the years. So to get a more constricted channel, we do um, brush bundling. And these photos are courtesy of Green Bay Trout Unlimited, who've done so much work over the years to help out um, streams on the National Forest. Uh, we really could not do the amount of work we do without them. So big thank you to Trout Unlimited and all the chapters. Um, and we found that the sedge meadow does come back. Um, if you just give it some time with these, the brush bundles are quite effective. And here you can see this gentleman throwing some sediment on top to kind of hasten the, the regrowth of veg. And here's a, a really good example of a stream that we pretty much cut the width down by half from where it was kind of the the old channel and you get that really nice sedge coming back that's going to hold the bank and get a nice deeper channel in there than what it previously previously was so now we're going to look at tag alder <clears throat> so i get a lot of questions from folks that see us you know taking the tag alder out and like well the trout like the you know they need they need to shade and stuff but um the main detractor of tag alders, it has a really poor root system. I'm sure, you know, everybody kind of knows they've seen that in field work out on the streams that you get this really heavy canopy, tag alder canopy collapses, and all that soil that the roots are holding is just in the stream now, and you basically widen the stream by four or five feet. So here's a, a ball of tag alder roots that used to be here, fell in, and now you got a problem of a wider stream. <clears throat> this is just kind of some pictures showing tag alder evolution. You get it in this beginning stretch where it's kind of growing up vertical, not a big deal. It's not in the stream. It's creating a little shade. Its roots aren't a problem. Um, then as you see, as it goes on, some of the roots get exposed here and you get a heavier growth and then it all just goes to hell and falls into the stream and um, you get a big slow stream that's warm and there's much less trout there you get a lot of suckers there instead um, your kind of warm water community comes back uh, we've been removing tag all around the forest for many many years um, it's kind of a cut bundle repeat sort of thing um, it works but one of the things that i'm trying to do um, as i'm getting going here is revegetating re with longer lived trees that can actually hold the bank. So um, there's a few sites I was looking at where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they did some habitat improvements and now it's just all tag alder again. It's like, well, we gotta, we gotta just do it all over again with no like break to that cyclone site. So um, the forest, we have a, a lot of nursery resources. So I'm hoping in the future to leverage those resources and start replanting where we're getting these nice solid banks again and um, getting some longer lived species in there. And this is what I'm calling hidden alder management. So we got a stream, kind of hard to see, sorry about the small picture where this road kind of breaks up the stream from a sedge meadow, alder meadow to um, kind of middle-aged hardwood forest. And within that hardwood forest, you get pockets of tag alder that you really can't see from any satellite photo or anything like that. So um, on a situation like this, where you've got a few large mature trees and there's 
chances are there's a nice big beautiful undercut under here that's holding fish. Um, these situations are the kind of things I'm looking at to replant. So getting that tree order in, clearing the tag alder out, and then putting new trees down in there. This is a revegetation project up on the Marengo River in Bayfield County that uh, TU has been partners with. And um, the banks have been stabilized with large wood where there was extreme uh, erosion on the slopes. And we planted a bunch of white pine there to kind of hasten the, the revegetation. Um, what I'm trying to start is things called intensive management zones, where being such a small crew, um, it's hard to kind of look at a couple miles of stream and be like, oh, well, we can't hit it all. So let's hit a few places really intensely and um, kind of get our best bang for the buck there. So doing more with less. Um, this is Price County, uh, Newman Creek. We've been doing brush bundle and stream restoration for probably 25 years there um, with TU's help. And with that intense management that's been going on for like pretty much every year where they're doing something, you could see the benefits of that frequency of improvement that it, if you're on it every year, you can make sure the alders cut back and make sure beneficial trees are growing and, and really help the fish out. So that's kind of what I'm looking at of doing more on the forest now going forward instead of just you know, repeating the cycle of cut and bundle and then do that every 20, 30 years. So, um, Like here's a trout stream in uh, Sawyer County. And you can see this is kind of like a trout desert. Um, there really isn't much cold water in this area except for Venison Creek. Um, here's a Chippewa flowage and it's kind of just um, northeast of there. Uh, it's a beautiful trout stream. It's tannic, kind of warm, but it does hold a lot of fish. And you got these really nice steep uh, banks with sedge, but there is tag alder en encroaching. So the strategy now is going to be just to go in there every year, really take back the tag alder and uh, just keep on it. More, more importantly, where the fishermen are fishing too. Um, I'm working with a local fisherman there who's been fishing it for 30, 40 years. And he's kind of telling me like, okay, this is where guys are using it. This would be beneficial for us and the trout. So just kind of getting a targeted approach of uh, where this management should happen. That's all I got. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Rod. <laughs> I had my hand up first. <laughs> hey, question on some of the alder management and such. Yeah. Are you using burning at all uh, in any of these areas where you're We currently aren't, but that's something that we're starting to look at. And, and I don't really have a lot of information to go at. I haven't met a lot of people that have been doing it. So um, that is something that we want to kind of put in the toolbox um, if we don't see many negative effects, effects to it. So that, that is something we're thinking about, though. I went to the ag school in Wisconsin, so you got to understand where this question comes from. Okay. Um, thinking about the silt load also as opposed to the tag alder population, would you ever consider using herbicides? I mean, you got a, you, you got a limited uh, manpower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, herbicides is something, another thing we've looked at, um, but we just figured out that the cost benefit just wasn't there um, as opposed to getting as much alder out as you can and doing, doing the bundles. Well, pretty, pretty cheap, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was wondering some of those depth differences that you'll see when you narrow that channel. Okay. And like how much is it in sizing or is it just deposition that's flushing? Uh, it's, if you can push the energy into that outside bend, 
that's that's kind of the most ideal deal situation is what we're looking at. So um, if I were to go to a stream and identify a, a point that's already undercutting and you're already getting a lot of fish there with good bank stability, I would work on pushing even more energy into that instead of trying to create a new undercut or, or new habitat. So I, I try to work with the stream instead of, um, you know, kind of taking a bigger bite out and trying to make something out of nothing. I guess if that makes sense. So, um, but it, it happens really fast. I mean, you can look just a year later from where you bundled, and and the stream is quite a bit deeper um, than what you what you left it. So it works extremely well. It's just we need a lot of it. It's just very time time consuming. <laughs> that, that's that's marvelous what you just said, Nick. Uh, uh, undercuts and working with the stream. That's, you know, that's the key to a lot in providing better places for trout. And that brings up a, a um, favorite misconception I like to attack. And that is that you, all erosion is bad. No, what forms those undercuts? It's erosion under the bank. And what holds the bank is vegetation. So it's the interplay of vegetation and stream current and soils that uh, that makes those wonderful places and let's have more undercuts and let them erode and push back and form and get destroyed and reform the stream will do that itself another question more questions uh, uh ellen oh okay got a got, got a microphone hi thank emma you. emma thank you <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question about the sedge meadows. So um, when you're doing that work, so are you, it's a process of removing the alder and then are you replanting or, or transplanting? Yeah. How does the, the sedge meadow come into play? So with the work if the soils are too poor to replant, then that's kind of off the table. Um, it's just too wet in a lot of places, but there's a lot of situations where it is I think you could support a longer lived tree like a white pine or hemlock. Um, and the forest ecologists who I talked to about planting certain species, they're like, yeah, there's this part of the forest is very deficient in white pine and hemlock and, and oaks and things like that. So they're like, yeah, if you can get in there and, and plant where you did your improvements, that would be awesome. Um, but as far as if you got a sedge meadow that's not very beaver influenced, like if every year, if you could just attack it, and, and get at the alder, you can do a pretty good job of preserving it, I think. So just as long as you're there every year, because it, it gets out of control fast. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Nick. Two questions. Uh, the first one, I just want to propose a scenario and, and see what you think. It, I understand and I, that- And I'm not an expert by any means. I'm just- Okay, just, <laughs> <laughs> well, for what I'm talking about, I guess I'm not really either. Maybe uh, Tracy might want to weigh in on this, but I'm, I'm wondering, I get it that the trout don't do well in the beaver ponds, but I'm wondering if the pond, the existence of beaver ponds that are transient over, say, hundreds of years, collects enough fine sediment and organic material that that facilitates the establishment of the sedge meadow once the pond, the dam and pond move somewhere else. So you're creating this mosaic of places where sedge vegetation can be essentially the succession mm -hmm. as the pond is abandoned. Uh, Tracy, can you give a thumbs up or thumbs down whether you think that's a Possible. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. So the other one is a kind of a quick question. I, Willows can be really effective in creating nice under stable undercut banks. I don't know enough about tag alder versus willows. Do you ever see, or have you tried to promote willow reestablishment rather than uh, once the tag uh, alders are under we've, control? We've never tried to establish willow, but we find it gets taken out by beaver a lot. So we just don't. They, they don't it, take out the tag alder? They don't, no, they, they don't eat it. I don't know if we could train them to do that, man. I. <laughs> I'd be out of a job. Or maybe I could ship them all to Rocky Mountain National Park. Yeah, yeah, we need some. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Willow, we, we haven't looked at planting it or anything like that. Not saying that it wouldn't work, but um, 
I mean, it's good where you see it. Yeah, it's it, it holds the bank well and fish are there and stuff. So um, I like it where it is, but yeah, just trying to get more of it's tough. <clears throat> yep. All right, well, I think everybody's seen enough of me and it's pizza time, so dig in. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you.